to go ahead and introduce you to our um, wonderful moderator today and Lillian. She will take over from here. Welcome Lillian. Thank you. I'm very, very grateful, Michelle, to be working with you and the National PKU Alliance and hosting this. Um, so I know some of you, some of you I don't know yet, but my name is Lillian Isabella. I have phenylketonuria as well. Um, and I am 31 years old. I just had a birthday last week and I still have to remember that I'm 31. Um, I live in New York City in Astoria and I have what is known as a typical PKU. Um, so my tolerance is a little bit on the higher side. Um, and to my other panelists, remember what I'm saying because you will be giving this very soon. <laughs> um, we're gonna go around and just each of us are gonna do a little breakdown, a little hello. Um, so continuing on with my hello, um, I'm not on Kuvan or Palamzik, um, and I have two parakeets. One is named Mr. Chirps, and the other one is named Clementine. Um, and then my favorite food is really anything from the website Cook for Love, which if you haven't heard of it, you can go check it out. It's amazing. Um, but maybe like top favorite on that is uh, penne alla vodka. Um, it's delicious. And now I'm just going to introduce our wonderful, wonderful panelists. Um, so we have, oh, and also I'm a playwright. I'm so bad at introducing myself. I'm a playwright and I'm also on the board of directors for the National PKU Alliance, um, which has been just so much fun um, to see what they do and to help be a part of that. So now the wonderful panelists that I will be asking questions. Um, we have Sophia, Gabe, Susan, Brittany, and Kurt. So um, starting with Sophia, and then we can go to Susan and Gabe and Brittany and Kurt. Just say your name, your age, where you're from, what kind of PKU you have, what your tolerance is, um, if you're on Kuvan or Palanzik, and then do you have any pets? What are their names? And if you don't have pets, what kind of pet would you want to have? Um, and then what's your favorite food? All right, so let's start hey. with Sophia. Hi guys, I'm Sophia. I'm from Idaho. And I can have seven grams of protein a day or 350 milligrams. Um, <laughs> I have two pets. I have a cat named Rosemary and a dog named Hattie. Yeah, that's it. Hi guys, uh, my name is Susan. I am 29 years old. I live in Maryland. Um, I have classical PKU. My tolerance is around uh, six milligrams. Um, I have, I am on Kuvan, by the way. Um, I have two pets, a guinea pig named Cuddles and a dog named uh, Robin. And my favorite food is either brownies or lasagna. Cuddles and rosemary, my goodness. What Robin. pet names? Robin, the dog's <laughs> name is Robin. But Sophia had a rosemary, I think. Oh. You guys have such great pet names. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm Gabe. I live in Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, I have hyperphenol area, so my like the amount I can handle is about 20 grams of protein. I'm on Kuban, so that's up to around 30. Um, and I have a dog named Charlotte, who she's with me, so I'm gonna pull her into the picture. A moment. Yeah, now she's out of here. All right. <laughs> All right, I think it's my turn. So, hi everyone. I'm Brittany Holmes. Um, I am 33. I live in Connecticut. Um, originally from the Boston area. I'm a nurse practitioner at the genetics program in um, New Haven, Connecticut, at Yale. Um, I've been a nurse practitioner there for almost six years now, um, and I started a PKU clinic there. So I um, run the PKU clinic, see a lot of PKU patients, um, but I also do have PKU. Um, I am a like, mild, moderate um, for PKU for, in terms of severity. Um, I also am on the board of directors with Lillian. Um, I am on Palanzik um, the first you know, 25 years of my life. It was you know, diet and formula. Um, but for the past, you know, eight or so years, I've now been on Palanzik, um, so my diet is a lot different than it used to be. Um, in terms of pets, I have a um, husky mix, and his name is Mako. 
Man, I'm the petless one, huh? Uh, I'm Kurt Sensenbrenner. I'm a documentary filmmaker. I'm 31 years old. I uh, have classical PKU, so my limit is seven grams, just like Sophia, 35, 300, 350 milligrams. Um, let's see, yeah, not on Kuvan, didn't respond to that, and haven't tried Pal and Zeke. Um, again, no pets. Uh, I'd like to have a, a dog and a cat, but I have a tiny apartment and uh, they would probably starve because I'm never there. Uh, and my favorite food is probably uh, low pro noodles with a uh, low pro pesto. Do you have a favorite uh, like dog name that you would want to give your dog or would it depend on like the type of dog that you had? So it, it depends, you know, the name, the name has to fit the animal, you know. <laughs> That's very true. I honor that. I agree with that. Um, all right, so we're going to kick off this uh, Q&A portion now. Um, let's start with something that none of us are doing too much of these days, which is travel. Um, though I'm sure that we're all planning our next trips and are very excited to get going with that. Um, Kurt's nodding his head because he's like the travel bug of the group of us. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to ask, let's start with Kurt and then Susan, I think you also might have some things to, that you wanted to share about this. Um, what, how do you travel with PKU? Um, and then have you traveled to different countries? And what would you say are your best tips for people who are gonna be traveling? Yeah, this is something I wanna to talk to in the breakout sessions, because everyone has travel experiences, whether it's you know the town over or countries over. Uh, and I really like to hear other people's travel stories and their tricks and tips and probably when uh, stuff didn't go right also. So uh, I'll, I definitely want to hear this in my breakout session. I encourage everyone to talk about it in more detail because, you know, certainly everyone's traveled in here uh, a little bit. But yeah, it's, it's mainly just making it a priority, right? Like prioritizing your PKU and having the trip um, for better or for worse you can't be a food tourist, you know? We can't go to France and try all the crepes we want and all the baguettes and croissants that we want. Um, so we have to be a tourist in a lot of other ways. And, and that's okay, you know, you can try the wines and things like that. Um, but, you know, you can take part in the culture, you can meet people, you can see the sites, take the same pictures and, and dope selfies or whatever kids are saying. And, and do that stuff so you can still enjoy it and have fun um but really prioritizing and not you know mentally yeah it's a hurdle it's a burden to take all these formula packets and to deal with tsa and things like that um and there are tricks and things that you can do that alleviate some of that stress certainly but uh it really is just making it a priority i think the biggest example of that and i'll be quick um was we took the last train into Prague and we were trying to find our hostel and it was like 11 o'clock at night. We were backpacking through Eastern Europe uh, and everything was closed. All the mom and pop shops, all the like, even the chain restaurants were closed. Everything was closed. The only thing that was open was a KFC <laughs> in Prague. And uh, of course it was just like, coleslaw was the only thing on the menu because I had eaten potatoes earlier that day and I was already at my limit. So I just had like four helpings of coleslaw and my formula and it was a, it was a pitiful meal at 11 o'clock at night, but I wasn't hungry anymore and I met my feed tolerance. So it's really prioritizing it. Susan, what do you have to add? Um, I find just kind of, like you said, prioritizing and also planning ahead. Um, before I travel, I usually get a um, a travel letter from my PKU clinic, and that's just a letter saying that my medication and my formula is medically necessary, and I need those. You know, it's, it's to make it easier when I go through security. Um, but sometimes it still takes forever, you know, because I've had um, I've uh, almost every time I've had to um, they had to hold me up, and then I. They have to um, look in my bag, see what I'm bringing, and then, you know, they'll just ask me to open it or ask me to, you know, drink it, or they'll pat me down and make sure that, you know, it, everything checks out. And so that does take a little extra time, so I just try to kind of mentally prepare myself before I get to the airport so I know what to expect. Um, 
and I just make sure to bring um, bring also uh, low protein noodles and also bread because a lot of um, places they don't um, they don't accommodate PKU very well, um, especially like places um, that are heavy um, restaurants that are heavy on meat and dairy that sort of thing. And so I just try to bring a lot of my own stuff. Um, if I can, I try to find um, lodgings that have a, a kitchen, you know, even like half a kitchen would be great because then I can kind of prepare things myself and I don't have to, you know, go to a restaurant and ask them ahead of time to make things for me. So it's a bit easier. Yes, 100% about traveling with the kitchen. Like, I don't know what I'd do without one. Um, you, you can definitely get a lot more creative. Um, all right, so let's let's transition into a question about transitions. What are some things that you guys would notice? I know that was really corny, but thank you for smiling, Brittany and Kurt. <laughs> um, what are some things that you guys have noticed about transitions from high school to college um, and college to life? And this question is really for um, Gabe and uh, Susan and also Brittany, because Brittany, I think you've gone to more school than all of us combined, which is very impressive. Uh, I can start, I guess. So, you know, I think transitions in general can be a tough time for, I mean, for people in general, not even just PKU, and then obviously add PKU in the mix and you can have new challenges. This in itself could be like its own presentation and topic, but for, you know, the specific things that I can think of for, um, you know, first the high school to college transition, um, you know, I think that was a challenging one because that was the first time that I was really going out on, you know, my own, living off on my own, um, kind of leaving the support system that I had, you know, my whole life up to that point. Um, but then I think, you know, some of the things that were really helpful during that transition, one was, you know, my parents did start the process beforehand of, you know, me taking more ownership and responsibility of PKU, you know, like me being able to refill things on my own, communicate with clinic. So it wasn't, you know, before that time, I think, you know, parents really do a lot of the management and, you know, some of the, obviously it depends on the person, but, you know, really just making sure that I was able to really independently manage when I was going off. Um, and then in addition to that, just finding a new support system. So, you know, being open with new friends and roommates, that was really key because then, you know, like I said, I had a new support system that I formed and my roommates were great. They honestly sometimes were more worried about my diet than I was. I feel like we'd go to a party or something and, you know, they'd be like, oh, are you going to have something to eat here? Are you going to be okay? And I'm like, I got it. You know, I've been doing this for a long time. I, I can figure it out by now. But they were always, you know, very supportive, very helpful. Um, and then just trying to know what's available to you. So for example, my college, you know, had a cafeteria. I was able to keep some of my low protein foods in that cafeteria and they would cook it for me if I wanted to. I would just have to call ahead. Um, so those are, I think, are some of the things that were the most helpful to, to prepare for that transition. And then going from, you know, college to real life, a lot of similar things, you know, um, instead of roommates now, it's my coworkers that kind of know and are my new support system. And again, just making sure I'm really able to do things independently. I think like for my tradition, I, it was pretty similar, honestly. So from going from high school to college, I didn't have like too much trouble. Like I basically like taking control of like everything with my PKU by myself, which like I'm super grateful for just because like it definitely came in handy. And college was like, it's kind of a weird experience because in high school, it's more like, oh, it, you're not on your own. So like, if you go to hang out with friends, it's like go for an hour or two and then you come back. Versus college, it would be like whole days. Like it's just, They'll go to class with people. They'll want to go play ultimate frisbee or something. Like go around, walk around campus. And they don't always understand. Like, oh, I gotta like, uh, I gotta run home real fast and do one of my shakes or something, you know. And then I like bring it with me and everything. But it was like kind of a different vibe like that. Um, I was in a fraternity too in college, which is like really it's interesting with PKU just because like everyone knows like everything about you and it's like a really tight-knit like community and it's just like and also like you know like fsl life i found is like a little bit like there are like elements of conformity to it where just like everyone like kind of acts similarly and so being so different and like it 
cast me out a little bit like we'd go to parties like everyone else is like looking at the alcohol content on the beers i'm looking at like how much protein it has like i'm looking up everything before i try it and so that was always difficult i think just being honest with people and like they you're not gonna like tell someone you got pq and they're gonna like hate on you for it you know like i feel like people respect like your honesty and they want to support you so i found that incredibly helpful and as far as like transitioning from college to adulthood that's what i'm doing right now i was so excited to show you guys my dog i forgot to tell you guys i'm 23 i just graduated college um so this is like my first apartment like out on my own in my own city and so that's definitely been a challenge i like my first level when I moved here wasn't like super great. And I've always had like perfect levels. I've never had a bad one. And so it's just, just like kind of what Kurt was touching on earlier, just like holding yourself accountable. Like you have to put PKU number one and put yourself in the driver's seat. Cause like, there's no one looking over your shoulder. When you mess up. Like if you mess up, it's on you. So I guess that's what I've found. I think that's really wonderful. Like the accountability and then also the support system that Brittany was talking about are very important. Um, and Susan, I'm just going to go on to the next question for time, but I want you yeah. to wait on this next question for yeah, sure. No problem. Um, so what do you say to people you meet who don't know that you have PKU? And this question's for Sophia and Susan. Uh, I guess I'll go first. Um, uh, it usually depends. Um, unless uh, we are going to sit down to eat, I usually don't start out with um, PKU as the main part. Um, but if I know I'm going to be seeing more of them and, um, you know, possibly eating with them, then I'll, you know, tell them a bit more in detail just because when I'm meeting new people, I don't want the first thing they know about me is, you know, I have PKU. What about you, Sophia? Uh, for me, I don't know, if I am going to explain PKU to someone, I'm just going to explain it. Just the whole thing, the whole shebang. I'm just going to go ahead and say everything about it, and they're going to look at me like, what the heck are all these scientific words that you're saying? And then some people will have questions for me, and I like when people have questions for me, or they'll just kind of have it be like that. And yeah, have no questions, think it's weird, but it's all good. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely in the same vein. I'd kind of just lay it all out there and they're like, wow, you're so smart. And I'm like, I know nothing about science except metabolics with PKU, but I sound smart. Um, so, so you guys, this is a question for everybody. Um, do you experience anxiety around feeling different because you have PKU? Um, and if you do, how do you manage that? I can kick it off if you want. <laughs> so um, I feel like maybe when I was younger, I had a little more anxiety about it. I think, you know, during school, there's a little more pressure um, to kind of fit in. And just because being younger and still, you know, not fully understanding it yourself, I think what helped for me is when I understood it better myself um, and, you know, was more comfortable with explaining it to people. And I, like I said before, I had that good support system. So I, I always felt kind of confident about, you know, I had people to turn to no matter what, like if I met someone new and they, I don't know, had an issue with it, then whatever, I don't need them, you know, because you had people in your life that you felt comfortable being open with it. And then I think, you know, once I understood more later on, now it's kind of, you know, it's not anxiety anymore. It's actually kind of like exciting almost like in, in a way you're, you know, very unique and special. And so when I was going through like grad school, if, you know, the topic of PKU came up, it was kind of like, oh, I know all about this and I can probably teach you guys more than what you'll find in the book. So I think, you know, it kind of had a point where it switched from being anxious about it to being, you know, feeling empowered by it and feeling, um, you know, like it was, it was something unique and special. And, and now it's, it's, not something that causes me anxiety. What about you, Kurt? Did you feel like you had a transition as well as you like went through your life? Yeah, I think, I think to a point everyone has that like coming of age moment of where you're insecure about whatever, you know, thing about you or thing about society that you don't fit and it changes. And for us, we have that. And then we have this PKU thing, you know, um, 
And yeah, it's just, it's just getting over it. I think you realize, especially with those transitions, you know, the more transitions you go through, the more you kind of learn that and it cements it that if people care about you eating different things or drinking a formula, cause it's the best thing for you, they're not really your friends and they're kind of choosing weird things to care about, frankly. Uh, but you have to learn that, right? No one can tell you that. And that's uh, just an empowering moment when, when you kind of realize it and start bringing your shakes to, to work or start drinking them at the lunch table or whatever the scenario is. Um, you know, it, it should just be matter of fact, um, but you have to get to that stage. And if you're having trouble with it, talk to people. I mean, that's why we have the panels and things like this. Like we've all been there and been insecure about it. So talk with us and, I don't know, talk to other people. That's really wonderful. Just for time, I'm gonna move on to the next question, but um, I definitely can relate to what you're saying, Kurt. And um, so I know Gabe, you were just talking about how you're in this really newly big transitional moment in your life because you moved into your own apartment in your city and you're kind of managing this really solo. And so I'm wondering, um, how do you incorporate PKU maintenance in your daily life? What does that look like now? Uh, so PKU maintenance, I don't know that it's really changed like a whole lot. Like my maintenance is the same. It's just like in a different environment. Like basically you know, ever since I've been growing up, I mean, I have a more like mild case. I've just like when I count like my protein, sometimes I won't like I'm not counting numbers like directly. It's more like I eat something like I eat something higher in protein. And it's like a homeostatic type of thing where like I need to have a salad. Or I need to have like something lower. I need to like counter like what I just ate. And so like I go and I do that. For me, the hardest thing is just finding time like within like an adult life to get all my formulas in. Just because it can be kind of hard. Like I take three a day and it's just, I, I get off work around like 5.30 and I, I eat lunch with my clients. Um, and so like I don't really have a lunch break. And so just getting all those in I think is important. I think just like, making time for PKU is my biggest like advice for like how to manage it in a new setting. That makes a lot of sense. What about you, Sophia? How do you kind of incorporate, you're in high school, right? How do you incorporate it into your life and your plans? I don't know. It's always been the same for me. I am fine taking my formula places and like all of my friends know about it. And so it's not really like a big deal for them. Like I have one friend and she's actually on here and I go over to her house all the time. Her family keeps formula there for me. So if I'm randomly go going over to their house or I'm randomly going over for a sleepover, I just have my formula there. They have low protein snacks for me and they're literally like my second family. They're so awesome and so supportive and stuff. So it's like, I don't know, wherever I go, like I have people that care about me and have to make sure that I take my formula or like whatever it is. I don't know. But yeah. That's really beautiful. I, I think it's wonderful that your friends keep that there. And I know like um, when I was working in an office, I also would keep formula in the kitchen in the office and they were very fine with that. And I think you can find ways to get that support, that external support, the running theme of tonight. Um, so what else uh, I'll send this question towards Susan to start with. And if anybody else wants to chime in, please do. Um, but what else do you focus on other than PKU to kind of bring your life into balance? Like, what are you passionate about? Um, so ever since I was little, I really loved books and reading. And that's just kind of been like a running theme throughout my life so far. So I'm just always reading, um, always uh, trying to get more books. Um, I think since I've gone off to college, I started learning how to cook more, um, like cook different meals. And so I'm also really big into cooking. Um, and I usually like taking, you know, regular recipes and kind of, uh, you know, making it more PKU friendly, you know, adding different ingredients and substituting different things. Um, and I also really enjoy uh, yoga as well so so yeah and um also love uh being with my friends my family my animals so it's a bunch of stuff. that's awesome 
and Sophia, you need to you need to drop your extracurriculars because I know there's okay. many. Okay, so I sing. I've sang the national anthem for two baseball games. I do acting. I just auditioned for Charlie and the Dot, Mrs. Gloop. That's like, you know, a little fat German kid. I'm a mom. So I'm excited about that. Um, I play ukulele and piano. I'm learning guitar. I have done horseback riding. I'm trying to get back into doing that again. Um, I love reading also. I love reading so much. It's so nice to just be able to, especially in quarantine, to just be able to pick up a book and like not be in the real world and just be wherever the heck <laughs> the book is. And yeah. That's very true. It's a, it's like the way to travel now is reading. <laughs> um, and we don't need to worry about our diet when reading. Um, so this is a question specifically for Brittany. Um, but have you seen certain key habits or behaviors in those who are able to maintain the strict PKU diet in your work as a nurse practitioner um, in the Department of Genetics at Yale? Yeah, this is a good question. Um, so I will preface this by saying, you know, everyone is obviously different. So what works for, you know, one person might not exactly work for everyone, but some of the key things that I do see. Um, a big one is, you know, communicating with clinics. So being in touch with your clinic, going to clinic, um, you know, having that relationship, um, you know, being involved in, in educating yourself or, you know, having clinic educate you. Um, and um, so that communication is key, but also routines I find are really helpful for a lot of people, especially PKU and people that have had higher fee levels in the past. Um, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, some of those things can be tough to do, like, that involve memory and things like that. So getting into a routine can be really helpful for that, um, you know, really in anything. So even for me, like, with diet and formula, routine was helpful, but even now with Pal and Zeke and not diet and formula, routine is helpful. So no matter what treatment you're on in terms of PKU, you know, getting into that routine, um, I think that can be really helpful. And then, um, you know, other than that, I think also what I want people to know is all of these things I think you know if you're someone that has been either off diet for a while or not under great control it's not something that you should expect to be able to you know do perfectly overnight so I think having that motivation or being able to at least take the first step like that's where we also see a lot of success maybe not you know immediately but you know once you take that first step and really just try to um you know slowly reach goals little by little and attainable goals so you know obviously if you try try to reach for something too much and you're you're having a hard time and you're getting really frustrated you know i try to tell patients you know try not to get frustrated let's take it back and and set a goal that's attainable and then we can slowly get there um so i think those are the, the most the probably the, the key things that i do see in patients that are able to either have already done a good job at maintaining diet or eventually you know can get there I really like what you said about not getting frustrated. It's kind of like you have to love yourself for trying like the each step of the way, you know? <laughs> yeah, I think that's, that's wonderful. Um, I actually, uh, okay. So the next question is, uh, did PKU have an impact on your career? Um, and if so, how? So let's start, start with Kurt. Cause I know he's a documentary filmmaker. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to say I don't, think so. I think you mean impact and like, do you mean impact in like your trajectory or impact in like, uh, yeah. I guess both. Um, yeah. And it could be yeah. about PKU to like, you know, an effect it had on your personality. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, I think it affected my trajectory. Um, I think as kids and, you know, probably into high school and stuff, at least I know I was always like, I'm going to become a doctor or researcher and I'm going to cure PKU and we're going to beat this thing. And then you're in a bio class learning about like cell mitochondria, RNA stuff. And you're like, no, 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 I'm not a scientist. Cool. Unless you're no. brave. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think it, I think it did change my trajectory and just how you see life. Um, I think, you know, because of having a rare disorder and not being part of the mainstream, so to speak, with that part of our life, at least. Um, I think we do have a lot of a lot of empathy and we can feel for other people that are having a bad day or 
feel outcast or ostracized for some reason. So, <laughs> um, yeah, you know, food is a very centric social thing. So I think that is, is part of our just experience in life. Um, and I think that did probably put me on a trajectory to, to tell people's stories and to do documentary film. Um, and another way it affected me real quick is that on set, I'm constantly meeting other people, you know, you have a set of 50 people and you're meeting them all for four days and then you're moving on to the next set with a bunch of different people. And you'll start to see repeat people on different sets and they'll remember me as the PKU kid or the kid with the shakes or whatever. So, uh, cause I'll always have my shake on set. So it's a, it's a good memory aid too. <laughs> Yeah, I've definitely found that to be true as well. And I'll, I'll talk a little about its effect on me and my career trajectory, because I think it definitely had one. Um, I, I'm a, I mentioned I'm a playwright, specifically I create documentary theater. Um, and then also I'm an actor. And I think that, and then how I, and my other, my other I'm a multi-hyphenate as many people uh, are these days, but I'm also a, a digital communications person. So I do like um, social media and customer support and stuff like that. So all of those jobs require empathy and they require a certain level of being able to communicate clearly. And I think that those skills are things that I learned through having PKU because from a very young age, I understood what it was like to be different. And I understood that you really can't judge a book by its cover. <laughs> you know, you never know what's going on in somebody's body or somebody's mind. And um, so I think I really learned from a young age, the importance of empathy, both from receiving it from others my parakeets are making a guest appearance, so excuse them. But um, both from receiving that empathy from others and sometimes not receiving empathy and, and witnessing what that felt like, you know, and then finding the way to kind of communicate anyway. <laughs> um, so like, I think that communication is also something that you learn from a young age with PKU because there's something you really, you repeatedly explain to people. Um, and I think you learn to be patient about it um, and be really open about it. And so... Uh, for, for my documentary theater, my first uh, feature-length play got produced at Cherry Lane Theater in New York City uh, last fall. It was a wonderful experience, um, and it involved a heck of a lot of communicating. Um, I had a producer on board, but I was also producing it, was co-producing, and there was so many moving pieces and just so much to keep track of, and um, it requires so much patience and love and empathy while being able to clearly communicate. Um, so I think that, yeah, definitely PKU influenced my personality and then that influenced my career trajectory for sure. Um, what about you, Brittany? So I think it probably is no surprise to anyone that PKU had a pretty big influence on my career since I literally work with PKU patients every day. Um, but you know, if I didn't have PKU, would I end up where I was? Probably not because I just don't think I would have really known, you know, about the field of genetics as much. Um, I was always interested in healthcare, but I was, um, I think also at some point leaning towards like the health and fitness side of things. But, you know, with having PKU and, um, you know, my parents always encouraged me to be very involved. So um, I, you know, attended NPKUA events since I was young and really love to network and love to talk to people from the patient side of things from the PKU side of things. And um, that kind of led me to, you know, deciding I kind of, you know, I really would like to have more of an impact. I'd like to be able to do, you know, not just the patient side of things, but also be able to help other patients, you know, if I um, am able to. So that kind of was what triggered me to go back to school. I had a really wonderful healthcare team because I grew up in Boston. So Boston Children's was just amazing and I was able to, you know, shadow with them and that really helped me see, um, you know, how much I, I really wanted to do this. So yeah, I think PKU definitely had a big, a big role, but you know, like Lillian said, I think it also really helps me in healthcare because it does have me, you know, it does allow me to have that background of knowing empathy and especially with patient care, like that's so important. And, you know, obviously <laughs> treating PKU patients, you know, I know where they've been, I know the struggles and that's something that, um, you know, I really like being able to do. I like being able to relate and, and help from, from both perspectives and not just, you know, the healthcare side that hasn't been there. Um, so I think that definitely has, has been helpful and led me to where I am today. That is awesome. And then this is just going to be the last question for everybody um, before we open it up to Q&A from 
those of you in the audience are participants. So um, get your creative juices flowing. Um, you're going to have an opportunity to ask us whatever you want very soon. Um, so this is for all of us, and we'll just go. Um, let's go Sophia first, then Susan, then Gabe, then Brittany, then Kurt. So the same direction we opened with. Um, so in one word or one sentence, outside of having PKU, what truly defines you as a person? I wish that I had more time to think about this. Jeez. Um, I don't know. I feel like I'm a creative person, just in general. Gosh darn it, you took my word. Now I gotta think of another one. All right, Susan. Uh, can I say books again? <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much it, books. What kind of books? Uh, all kinds. Um, I think I started with just like children's books. The very first book that I got when I was little was uh, The Very Hungry Caterpillar by Eric Carl. Um, and so now I think I've branched out quite a bit from that. Um, I've read um, Young Adult, uh, Mystery, uh, a lot of true crime stuff um a lot of fiction because i was in school for english so i read a lot of you know um literature so i'm starting to kind of branch out into more like non-fiction maybe self-help just kind of reading um you know a wide range of stuff or trying to read a wide range of stuff that's awesome all right gabe what about you uh i'd say dreamer honestly like i don't know like i'm a young kid i don't really know what i want to do exactly um but like just from the support i have received from the pku community like i have like in my eyes like the best support system so like i've got so many people that every day tell me like you can be something you can do this and so like how can i fail you know so i don't know all the treatment i received pku and just like not pku i just feel like i'm put in a position to succeed every day and i have that ability to dream which i'm thankful for That is beautiful. All right, Brittany, you're up. Um, so I like what Gabe said, because I this is something I'm really big on, on, you know, your identity being something than, than just PKU. Obviously, PKU is a big part of our lives. That's, you know, something clear. But, you know, I think there's so much more to everyone and, and having those things that you like to focus on. So I don't know if I can really define it in one word, because I feel like there's so many, you know, other parts of me other than just PKU. But you know, obviously being a nurse practitioner is a big part of my identity. I feel like, you know, I really love what I do. Um, so like, you know, being a nurse practitioner, being a lover of fitness, I, you know, really love fitness and working out and health and, you know, focusing on that. And then um, I like to explore and travel. Um, so I think those are probably, you know, some of the main things, at least, you know, of my identity aside from PK. Wonderful. All right, Kurt. Uh, right now, I think my one word would be busy. <laughs> I feel like I'm super busy lately. Um, just have a lot of video projects going on, both in my nine to five producing job and directing and producing my own. And uh, yesterday, fully minted uh, pilot. So that's exciting and gonna brag there for a second. But uh, yeah, it's just been a super busy uh, few months even. So. Are you allowed to talk about the details of that yet or not yet? Is it still top secret? Uh, still top secret, holding the cards close. But yeah, we're work, working on a bunch of different stuff, going to West Virginia for a video project for work and just all sorts of logistical problems. But I'll Kurt, fit in there with the, with the beard and the flannel. Though, so that's good. <laughs> Kurt flies airplanes, guys. It's just so intense. I bring it up every time I'm in the same room with him because it freaks me out so much, but it's so cool. Um, so I guess my one word uh, would be intuitive. Um, it's something I've been learning to trust more. Um, I think we don't necessarily live in a world where intuition is valued, um, but I definitely think it's starting to be more and it's something that I, I've found to be a wonderful way, like going back to the empathy and connection. I think that intuition is like a combination of both those things and learning to trust that and learning to um, you know, uh, really 
honor the value that that brings to a situation is sort of what the journey I've been on lately. Um, yeah. And now uh, we're going to turn it over to Michelle. We're going to turn it over to you guys because we want to hear your questions. All right. Okay, everybody. Who has questions? You want to start? Um, Marika Cook. Go ahead with your question. Hi. <laughs> um, so I was invited here by the lovely Susan. She's my best friend. In college. Hi. Glad you made it. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here. Um, she's the loveliest of people, <laughs> as you already know, I'm sure. Um, and uh, she inspired me uh, to do a project when I was in neurobiology about um, PKU. Um, it was a longi it was a, a longitudinal study about um, white matter development in people with early treated PKU. What I'd originally wanted to do was um, something about working memory in PKU but I wasn't really able to find any research about it at the time. It's been some time now. Uh, that was way back in 2014. So um, I didn't know if, if anyone knows there's any more research about, about that particular area or anything. I, I, cause I, I'm afraid I haven't really kept up with it, but I'm interested to know if there is anything. I think that might be a great question for Brittany. Yeah, no, that's a good question because, you know, PKU in the brain is something we've been trying to study for a long time. And, um, you know, that like you talked about that white matter in the brain is, is something that we have known, you know, the white matter for those that, that don't know what she's talking about. Um, in, in elevated fee levels, we have seen white matter changes in the brain. White matter is basically um, kind of like if you think of, um, you know, like a plug that the, the, the covered part. Um, so it kind of helps transmit messages. So the white matter can be affected when the fee levels are high. Um, that can improve when you get fee levels back under control. So that's why we encourage people, you know, even if your fee levels are high, it's still still good to get back under control. Um, but those are things that we've known about for a little while. But then there's other parts of the brain like gray matter. And then there's, you know, really specific details like working memory that she was talking about. Um, those things are things that are still being studied. We actually recently had a little conference that this was being talked about um, in, in some of the things that you can see. So there, there are things that you can see with, with elevated fee levels for sure. Um, Sean Christ, he's a, a researcher that has been um, really focusing, like spending a lot of his um, time on PKU in the brain. Um, so he's a good person to try to look up. He's doing a, a lot of different research um, and he has you know some that's published, some that he's still working on. So you guys, I'm sorry, what was that name again? <laughs> I'll need to write Sean, it. Sean, it's, it's spelled S-H-A-W-N, and then Sean Christ, C-H-R-I-S-T. Okay, thank you. You guys have mentioned working memory a couple of times. Um, is that, like, how does that, what is, what is working in front of it? Like, how does that differentiate from just saying memory? Just for the layman's of the room. Um, so a working memory is the memory that you're using as you're sort of prob actively problem solving. Uh, the uh, the memory like um, a, wor a working memory task say would be in if like a performing addition you know doing something uh, something I just remember when I did a working memory test in college I did two column addition tests and so on so uh, yeah uh, things that require sort of drawing on your knowledge and uh, applying it logically or not but <laughs> I think, you know, people probably use the, the word also, you, you probably all maybe heard or maybe haven't, but executive function is a big word that we use um, with PKU and, um, you know, elevated fee levels, especially executive function is one of the things that can be affected um, that you can see even when, you know, you're someone who has been treated, but it, fee levels are starting to get a little higher. Executive function is, is you know, something that you need for things like, um, you know, planning or completing any type of task. So you need things like memory and, and all different types of things to, to complete those tasks. So that's something that we do see can be affected when the fee levels um, start to get elevated. Okay, um, moving on to the next question. Um, Kendall Temple. Hello. Can you hear me okay? We can yes. hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so 
there was a couple different questions that I wanted to ask him. Um, I was just wondering, has any of you all experienced any type of mental health diagnoses over the years? I'll start this out. Yeah, sorry. Uh, no, go ahead. Finish your question. Um, I know that um, kind of going along with uh, the last person's question is, you know, we know that dopamine is affected, which is part of the neurochemical that gives us pleasure. And I'm just wondering if people have ever dealt with depression or any compulsive behaviors, that sort of thing. Yeah, I'll start it off um, just because I know that I'm super comfortable talking about it. Um, but I, yes, I have, in short. Um, I was diagnosed with OCD uh, about two years ago now. Um, and I have been in cognitive therapy ever since then. Um, I go twice a month. I found it's enormously helpful. Um, and it was interesting to me because when I got that diagnosis, I was like, oh, right, that makes sense. And I was able to identify from when I was like younger, you know, what I now recognize are symptoms of OCD um, had been present for a while. Um, and I found that cognitive therapy is very helpful. But then also, um, I, and I realized this conversation might make some people uncomfortable because, you know, we do have, we do have some barriers around mental health and speaking about it openly. But um, I, I think that it's important to talk about it, so I'm going to. Um, but I also recently, like in March or so, um, I was starting to have symptoms of depression. And it was something that my family was encouraging me to check out and to speak to a doctor about. And I mean, who wasn't feeling depressed in March? <laughs> but, I mean, there was a lot going on in the world, but um, but I did I did go see a therapist, and it was the same therapist I'd seen two years ago. And two years ago, he told me, "Oh, you just you just need cognitive therapy." Um, and then more recently, he was like, "Actually, I think it might be helpful um, if we also added some medication to the mix." So I'm on a very low dose of medication to help treat OCD and depression. And my life has changed rather dramatically since I started to take that. And this is coming from someone who's been on diet my entire life. Um, mm -hmm. I've never gone off diet and I've always drank my formula every single day. Um, but I do, so, you know, and, and honestly, I'm gonna take this moment, they did not ask me to do this, FYI, but I'm gonna take this moment to plug um, the National PKU Alliance's uh, survey that they're doing. And Michelle, you can like give me the exact name of it, but, um, Basically, they're, you know, collecting people's answers for symptoms and stuff like that um, on this ongoing survey. Uh, and I think it's really important for us to fill that out because without that, without like some kind of big amalgamation of data, there's no way to tell if the thing that I'm experiencing is something related to PKU or if it's something else in my family or if it's just me. Um, and you really need a large subset of data to be able to tell like, you know, is this related to PKU or isn't it? But that being said, yes, I have experienced some of that. I've been talking for a while, so if anybody else wants yeah. to jump in. Okay. I can add, uh, you know, kind of from both perspectives. Um, you know, so obviously, as I mentioned, I'm on Pound Zeke now, but prior to that, um, I definitely did have anxiety, especially, you know, going through school. I mean, there was, you know, a lot <laughs> to try to juggle in school. So I did have um, some anxiety that definitely improved once I was on you know, started Pound Zeke. Um, I wouldn't say it's like completely gone away, but you know, of course there's a lot of, like Lillian said, a lot of things going on in the world right now. Um, and you know, like she said, there's obviously, you know, sometimes people might've had anxiety, whether or not they had PKU, sometimes it could be related. Um, from the healthcare side, we absolutely do know that elevated fee levels can lead to the neuropsychiatric things such as anxiety, depression, um, OCD, um, all those things can be related to high fee levels. Um, we can also see improvement once fee levels get back under control in a lot of those. So that's another reason why we encourage it. Um, you know, from the healthcare side, we try, you know, neuropsych evals um, is something that we would love to be able to do more, obviously, depending on your clinic. Sometimes those resources are limited, but, you know, I always encourage people don't feel hesitant to be open about that with your providers you know that's what we're we're there for so if you're you know feeling like you have some anxiety or depression or something you know definitely feel free to talk to them about it and they can make sure that they either get you to the right person for more evaluation or for treatment or you know whatever is the, the best next step yeah so just some healthy peer pressure here um i i disclosed it on a panel you don't need to disclose it on a panel but definitely disclose it to your doctor all right <laughs> so, so hey Brittany it's good to see you anyways um but 
you know, when, so I'm on Powell and Zeke. Um, I was, I'm, I'll be 53, no, 54, uh, the 27th of this month. And I've been off diet since age 11. So 40, whatever years it's been. And, um, you know, my fee level right now is the last one was like 1.3, um, from like 38, I think. So yeah, I see that face. So it's been, um, been a huge change for me. And when you, when Brittany was talking about executive function, uh, that was a, that was something that in my forties, I really, really was having serious problems with, um, uh, my, um, uh, it caused a lot of issues with relationships, um, and, um, with, um, kids and all that kind of thing. And, um, so that's been something that I struggled with and why I was actually in the, uh, peg pal trial. And during that, um, they did a psych eval and, um, of course I found out I have, uh, ADD, which probably should have known. Um, and so just like you, depression and that sort of thing was part of my story. Um, and of course I take medication for it. And part of the reason that I brought up, uh, the dopamine and all that kind of stuff is because I, uh, work as a substance abuse counselor. So I do the cognitive behavioral a lot. So, um, understand where you're coming from. And so that was just, a uh, something that I was just curious if other people, um, dealt with, um, because it's something that, um, now where I am today, the executive function, it's like the memory, the, it's just totally different from where I was a while ago. Um, That's so. amazing. Thank you so much for sharing yeah. that. Um, and um, I want to thank all y'all for hosting this um, because I haven't met anyone with PKU since maybe five years ago, five, six years ago, before I kind of got a little involved. So this is amazing to see all you guys. Oh, hi, Susan, by the way. Anyways. Okay, thank uh, you for joining us. Okay, uh, Sarah Gallagher has a question. I hope it um, connects. It just started saying my internet was unstable, but can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. we can hear you. I'm here as a parent, and I had a question about, a few of you spoke about your social network, support networks, uh, friends that have been very supportive. Uh, my question is, have you all built close friendships within the PKU community with other people who have PKU? If so, how important have you felt like that has been? Um, I have a 10-year-old daughter, and it's, it's you know sometimes obviously a struggle to form close relationships with other people in the community just because of distance and you know, the rarity. Um, so I was, I, yeah, A, wondering how, how important do you feel like that is to have someone who you're close with who, who has PKU? Um, and if you have built that, kind of tips for, for families on building that. Yeah, I'll, I'll start. My, so my sister, who we all just saw, she has PKU. Um, and mm -hmm. that was obviously very wonderful for me to have growing up because we were able to be kind of a support system for each other um, and talk about what was going on. And then um, I did start to reach out and go to the summer camps. There's summer camps around the country for people with PKU and I met people there um, and I went to the conference and I, I, Kurt and I connected on social media years ago and then I met him in person for the first time at the conference. Um, and I would say Kurt is one of my good friends, like we've known each other for a while now and we've worked on a couple of projects together and um, I think it's wonderful to be able to just like call him up and be like, hey, how are you doing? You know, catch up on life. We're in a similar industry as well. We're both freelance artists, so that's nice. And um, there's, I think what's nice about it is that you don't need to describe PKU. So it takes an element of the pressure off of like being different. And then you can just talk about other regular pressures that life gives you. <laughs> For me, okay. So I have a couple of friends that have PKU and I started going to a camp in Oregon about five years ago and that's where I met Lillian and I kind of met Kurt and um, I have a couple really good friends I still talk to I talked to a couple of them on the phone today and like they're just people that they're just automatically like family 
they just understand every situation that you've gone through, whether they're the same age or younger or whatever. And I don't know, it's just so nice to be able to talk to someone who's going through the exact, I don't know, it's really nice. So yeah, if your daughter can find someone even online that is around her age to be able to connect with, that would be awesome. And by the way, like, I'm going to speak for everyone, but I kind of feel like we're all open to staying connected, everybody on the panel, and like, we'll share our like Instagram handles, and you know, I don't know if she's on Instagram, but emails, and if you, Sarah, have any questions, or you want to reach out to us, like, please do. Great, thank you. Thanks so much for doing this. I will say to answer that question real quick, Sarah, um, that I was, I think, 24 when I met someone with PKU for the first time. And it was, uh, it definitely has changed the trajectory of how I interact with the PKU community, how, you know, I'm doing things like this now, which I, you know, was watching the panel before. And so it's, it's definitely a new experience going from 24 years of living with PKU and then to now have people, friends, you know, have a PKU community surrounding me is, uh, it's a really cool experience. And you, you know, don't feel pressured to have PKE friends, you know, I think there's a huge benefit from it, but you can have, you know, no connection with the PKU community outside of your clinic and your, <laughs> and your medical professionals. Uh, and it's not a, it's not a failure of the PKU lifestyle, you know, um, you can be successful in both realms, but it's definitely enhances, I think. Okay. Um, we're going to move on to one more question. Um, we probably have time for two more questions. Christina, do you want to go ahead and unmute and try to find your video? Oh, there you go. There you are. I think I just got it to work. Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Uh, I have to apologize ahead of time. I'm kind of nervous because I have like huge social anxiety. So going on with all the other stuff, you know, anxiety, that, yeah, that's definitely prevalent. Um, I, uh, I just want to add on that, um, like, I agree it really, really helps to, like, as nerve wracking as it is for me to talk to like new people and stuff, uh, how awkward I get. Um, it's really great to be able to talk to people with that actually struggle with the same stuff. I um, I really like my whole life never was able to really talk to anyone else with PKU for like, I don't know, maybe like the past like five years, they kind of like uh, recently, you know, like I actually got to uh, start meeting new people through online and stuff. I. I think the first time I started actually um, connecting with people, I had a, I did this like research uh, study thing, you know, that I met a few people through and like became friends on Facebook and it just kind of snowballed from there. And it's, it's really, really helpful, especially when um, like growing up in the, you know, late eighties, early nineties and stuff, there was like not any of the help that I had that I have now back then, like there's, as far as like food, especially, you know, there's like so much more in stores and all for like vegans and all that, you know, we can have now that's so much easier. But I really just the support I've gotten online has just been so helpful. And uh, I actually found this whole thing through uh, Lillian. I had her on, you know, Facebook or something. <laughs> But I really, I was interested in saying hi to her. I've, I've like always read her stuff and everything. I just never really got to say hi. Cause once again, I'm just lurking. Can't, you know, well, so really nice. nervous to talk to people, but you know, I just, I wanted to say hi to everybody. And you know, anyone can add me on Facebook if you want. Like I, you can find me under Christina Newcomer. That's my old name. It's much easier to find me under that than Christina Smith. <laughs> Since, you know, a lot of people with that name, but. You know, I just wanted to say hi to everybody, and um, I'm really thankful for this whole panel. It's so nice Thanks for to sharing. You. Nice to meet yeah. you. I can um, add real quick too, from like you know the healthcare perspective. I definitely always encourage patients 
any type of like conference, like through MPKUA or events, I think are super helpful. Not even just the, the educational piece is, is helpful because obviously we only have time for so much during clinic, but that's helpful. But networking, like everyone has said here, I mean, for me growing up, that was also huge. Just made me even feel more comfortable even talking outside of PKE, but having them is definitely helpful. So I, I always encourage patients, you know, to try to attend events if you can. And the national, the national PKU Alliance has scholarships that you can apply for to attend these various events, which I've applied to in the past and it's been very helpful. So yeah, watch for more information in the new year. So, um, so we'll take one more question from Ellie. And then if everyone wants to connect, like after this, if you want to put some kind of contact information in the group chat, I should be able to download that. Um, totally optional and then share it with everybody by email to just keep it private so we're not announcing it on here. Um, go ahead and do that, okay? Ellie, do you have one last question and then we're gonna break out in our breakout chat rooms. Hi there. Okay, just like it's super loud out here, so let me put in my earbuds. Okay. okay, is it my turn? Yes, go ahead. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, so I am here because my friend Sophia invited me to watch, and I had a question that I want to know you guys' answer to. Um, so I know PKU can obviously be really hard at times, and I've seen that. Um, just because Sophia is like my best friend and we spend a lot of time together. But what is one awesome thing about PKU? What would you say personally? What is one awesome thing about PKU? That's my favorite question in the whole wide world. <laughs> um, I think my favorite thing about PKU um, is, is that it makes me different. Um, I think that it's a source of strength for me um, and a, a source of personal power to know something so well and to have so much self-control um, and to, like I mentioned earlier, like the empathy, being able to understand other people um, because I know that I'm different than most people. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thanks for letting me ask that. Oh, come on, we gotta get like one or two more people's answers. Okay. Yeah, I was, I was, <laughs> <that hurt>. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, uh, yeah, I think we just inherently have something that forces us to have discipline and learn discipline. And a lot of people, you know, find discipline through sports or academics or religion or other outlets. And, and we have it from the start. Like, we have to be disciplined in the very nature of it. And, uh, you know, that's a struggle on its own, but it also makes you super strong and the ability to deal with that. And uh, it's... It's definitely tough, but, and it is a, you know, it varies <laughs> your ability to handle that. Um, but it's, uh, I think it's, it's powerful. I see Eric Peters just chatted us and said, he said it taught him empathy at an early age. Absolutely. Yeah. 